is one of the most powerful women in Westminster with a reputation of being fiery and outspoken. But getting to her senior political position hasn't been easy, not just because of her gender, but because also of her working class background. Well, to tell us about life as deputy leader of the Labour Party, we're joined now by Angela Rayner. Good morning and Good welcome. Morning. It's Thank you. you here. Um, it's funny because you see you in Westminster doing your job, t carrying out your role. I didn't actually know too much about your background until I read this. And I'm not sure, I mean, a lot of people will do, but mm. a lot of people won't. But it was that background and your upbringing that really shaped you who you are as you sit here on the sofa today. Yeah, and it was crazy when I first went into Parliament because, you know, the whole building is like going to Hogwarts. It's a bit yeah. surreal, you know, yeah. and I, I still think that, you know, when I stand at the dispatch box and you think of the people Who've that have stood there you. and been there before me, it's a bit like, wow, yeah. I'm here and I'm doing this, you know, so it does feel a bit surreal from growing up on a council estate and, you know, having my son at 16 and, yeah. and basically, you know, um, being very poor and having very big challenges and then all of a sudden being in mixing with people who went to private education, yeah. who have got loads of wealth. And I remember having a joke once with one of the MPs talking about the issues on our estate because there was um, cat, um, horses churning up the grass on the estate. And he went, oh, we, we have llamas on our estate. I'm like, no, I'm talking about the council estate. <laughs> and, were, and the horses oh that God. were just left in the wild. So it was a bit, you know, those moments where two worlds collide. Yeah. When you yeah. left school at 16, um, <laughs> You were told that you wouldn't amount to anything. Yeah. What was life like for you then, and life at home? You see, this is a thing, because in Parliament, people do see me as quite brash and quite confident, but part of the reason I'm like that is because when I was 16 and I was, I was pregnant, the shame and the humiliation that people made me feel, like, mm. you know, institutions of government, you know, doctors, police, they were there above you. And they were there to do things and you had to keep order. They, they weren't people like you. Yes. So I, I always felt, know your place. So I felt that humiliation and shame then. So now I'm like, no, I, I'm proud of who I am and I'm proud of the people that I represent mm -hmm. and the people that I grew up with. So now I don't have any cares about speaking my mind and being, because everyone's got unique talents. It doesn't matter where they're from, whether mm -hmm. they're from an affluent background or not, but these people from working class backgrounds that are from a very young age taught to know your place, you know? Yes, yeah. But, and and I, I learned that and then I unlearned it and realised that actually it's important that people do speak out. And, and do you think that therefore actually um, um, within Parliament there needs to be a bit more broader representation of people from all sorts of walks of life then? Because obviously clearly it's so important. Yeah, and you know, there's so many colleagues from different parties that have got working class backgrounds, but it almost gets taken out of them. And it's a frustration for me, because when I speak to them... Who's and taking it out of them? The system. They, just, they grow up thinking that in order to be something, you have to speak a certain way, or you have to hide that you didn't have... Like, I talk about not having a formal academic education, mm -hmm. and then people say, oh, you're thick. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm clearly not because yeah. I wouldn't be in the job I'm doing now if I was stupid. Yeah. But I just learned in a different way, and I had challenges in my life when I was early, um, in my when I was younger. So I wasn't on education. My mum had bipolar and was very depressed. So mm -hmm. I was looking after my mum and things like that. So education wasn't drilled into me as important. But that doesn't mean to say that I was less intelligent. No. And I think a lot of people think that you have to speak a certain way or you don't talk about those things because you're ashamed or you're embarrassed by it. Whereas I you, think we should talk about it more. I you agree. spent some time working as a carer. I mean, I so did, you were yeah. working within the, I loved the social it. services. Yeah. So when you have that sort of background, um, the background with your mum looking after her, the background of having um, a, a child when you were very young, um, the background of, of that uh, growing up uh, in, in the sort of social area that you grew mm. up in, um, when you get into Westminster, do you look at it and think, you have no clue what's going on in the outside world. Yeah, sometimes it's really frustrating because one of the biggest challenges that I found, so when I had Ryan, I ended up on income support and I needed that support at the beginning. Now, obviously, I, I, I pay my taxes. I'm a, a, you know, a high income earner. And, but at that time, I needed that little bit of help and I felt humiliated and ashamed to ask for help. And people that use food banks now, it's that humiliation. It's not a lifestyle choice, but some people think, oh, it's a lifestyle choice to do that. You know, you're responsible. And the, the difficulties and the challenges I had, I just wanted to be a good mum. Mm. I wanted to go to work, I wanted to help, and I wanted to do the right thing. But the system at the time was a struggle for me. 
but I managed to, you know, get on and achieve. And, and I think the misconception a lot of time is people think, oh, well, they're on benefits, so they don't really want any, they don't aspire to anything mm. in life. And the challenge is that, you know, some of the people who I grew up with, my friends, they've got, like, children, they're on the breadline, they're struggling, and, and, you know, I've helped them out in the past. If, you, if you've got no money at the end of the month and then your fridge breaks down, your fridge freezer, you can't get credit to get a fridge freezer, it's impossible. And you don't have a couple of hundred quid in the bank no. to just go and buy one. Yeah. And that pit in your stomach, that feeling of absolute dread, what am I gonna do, the panic? And I think sometimes people in positions of influence, like um, politicians, they've never felt that. They've no. never this felt that, that fear Has this of made not you... being able to look after your, your family. Uh, quite, quite obviously, you know, you have a, you've got a lot to look back on. You have an immense amount of experience. Has it made you Angry. I mean, you are you are outspoken. I mean, there yeah. are times when you haven't held back. I mean, <laughs> you uh, said in October 2020, you used the word scum in reference to the Tory MP Chris Clarkson in the midst of a Commons debate. Late night event in September 21 at the Labour Party conference, you described the Conservative government as homophobic, <clears throat> racist, misogynistic, and vile. A bunch of scum. Now they are big. They're big words. Mm. Uh, Keir Starmer, I think, said they're not quite the words that uh, that sure. I wouldn't use. Have you, is that because you are angry and frustrated or is that just the person that you are speaking your mind? No, it's because I get really <clears throat> frustrated and, you know, you do have to watch Tom because obviously people have, have got abuse and I, I don't condone abuse. What I want and what I aspire is that people get involved in politics because it matters. And the reason why I get so angry about that is because if you're in, Boris Johnson has said some pretty awful things, very, very bad things that actually, even if you're in a, a job working in a supermarket, you'd been sacked mm. for the things that he said so I think why do you treat a supermarket worker to a standard that you say if you said that comment that you wouldn't be in the job but the Prime Minister of the country has never apologised for those comments. It's the hypocrisy of it, mm. because they're posh and they've gone to a posh school. But you didn't, didn't apologise but... for saying uh, homophobic, racist, misogynistic and vile. No, I've, I've, I've asked Boris Johnson to actually have a debate with me on this, because I really want to say to him, because this is the problem that I have. If you, if you put working-class people, ordinary people doing their day-to-day -day job, your lorry driver, whatever, to a standard that says, if you use language, like, you know, um, the language that Boris Johnson used, which has been racist, it has been homophobic, it has been misogynistic, they wouldn't last five minutes in their job. Yet you've got the Prime Minister who thinks he doesn't have to apologise for those comments and he could say it. Mm. So it's a hypocrisy for me. I accept that some of the language was, you know, it was, it was not the language that they would use, but for me, it's the frustration of you, you treat people to a different standard. So if I walk into a room, for example, because if I've got a Manchester accent, I have to prove, and because I'm a woman, I have to prove why I've got the skills to do my job. If Boris Johnson walks into a room, because he's from Eton, private educated mm. from a certain class, and he's a man in a suit, He's automatically, oh, well, he must know what he's talking about. Well, you walk about. up to the dispatch box and you get that as a woman at the dispatch box because you will be uh, abused online and trolled online because of what you're wearing. Well, Whereas it's funny because I keep saying, you know, I'm going to turn up for PMQs one day, I'm going to ruffle my hair so it looks really scraggy, like I've not got up and done anything with it. I'm going to wear a bland suit with a pair of male shoes on and put no makeup on. And then when I get, like, the tsunami of abuse saying, look at the state of her... How can she turn up like that? I'll say, well, I'm just dressed exactly the same way as the person opposite me. Because you do get, unfortunately, yeah. you do get, you know, um, a different standard and you do get um, criticised for whatever I wear, whatever I say, And you do get a lot of abuse online as well. And you've spoken about this before, actually, women, women within politics, they do receive a lot of abuse online. And how do you shut off to that? Do you read it? Do you look at it? Does it stop you being able to do your job as well as before? But it goes back to what I said before about being growing up on the council estate, being a ginger kid who was poor and then having a child when I was a child myself at 16. Yeah. Um, I already had that level of abuse and that stigma and I always, I, I felt that there was, um, you know, I was bullied and everything else. So what I get now doesn't, doesn't impact on me because I think I'm, I'm worth it. And that's why I say what I say in the way I do because I want the young people of today and the young single mums like me to know that they are absolutely worth it. Yeah. Don't let anyone make you feel like you're not valid because you absolutely are. And, you know, you can speak like your mates do. You, you might not have all the big fluffy language, but you articulate yourself. Do you think traditional politicians are fine. nervous of you? 
Like, do you think that you sort of hold a mirror up to something that's quite old fashioned in some ways? Yeah, some of them are. They don't quite know how to take me. They're a bit like, whoa. And I think that's the other thing as well, because Mancunians were a bit in your face, you know, and, and where I grew up, it's like, you know, we are a bit boisterous and loud and, and they, they see it as, whoa, you're a bit full on. And yeah. actually that's quite normal, you know. In fact, I'm, I'm quite tame compared to how <laughs> well, you, I am when I'm with my mates said, in Manchester. You said of, of Keir Starmer, fair to say that me and Keir are completely different in the way we do things like putting two dogs together in a room, they'll fight for a bit, then they'll find a way and then they become best of mates. We haven't quite got to be best of mates yet. Um, do you want to be leader? I want Keir to be Prime Minister so that I can rock it at the side and I can go in number 10 and he has all the responsibility of being Prime Minister and I can get all of the stuff that I think will help so working class people from my background. you don't, you don't, you have no background. ambitions to be Prime Minister? I want to get into number 10 with Keir. I just want to get into government. Do you know what? Seriously, seven years nearly I've been on frontline politics. I've, I've sacrificed seeing my kids as much as I want. I'm a grandmother now. Mm. I haven't seen my granddaughter as much as I'd like to. And for me... Opposition is not a place to be because you can't change people's lives. Mm. I want to be able to do all the things that I know will make the difference that helped me mm. when I was growing up. And that's my number one target is to get into government so that we can actually implement policies that will change people's lives. So, you know, the cost of living now and I talked about worrying about if your fridge freezer breaks. Yeah. I don't want people to feel that pit in their stomach if they're working. I want them to feel confident where, that they can live their you, lives. Where would you find the, 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 the money? Because UK prices rose by 6.2% in the 12 months to February, fastest rate for 30 years. Mm. Fuel, energy, yeah. food costs, absolutely soaring. You've got Rishi Sunak today delivering his mini budget. Um, there is only, like any household in any yeah. country, there is only a limited pot of money that you can you can dish out. Where would you guys find sure. the money to pay for what you're asking? And, and, you know, the most important thing about what you're saying as well is those costs, those day-to-day -day costs. People who are on low incomes and ordinary people, working families, they spend majority of their wages on those costs. It's a bigger pot of what they spend on. And we've said that the, the oil and energy companies have made massive profits, over £40 billion they've made. They didn't expect to make that level of profit. We said the government should do a windfall tax. We've done it before and they should help with the household bills now because people cannot yeah. find that money. It's not a case of, oh, well, it's just going to tighten your belt. Mm. People cannot find that money. It is, you know, energy bills are going up 50, 56%. You know, how can people find that money? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's people are literally petrified mm. about it. So we have to do something. The energy companies made huge money that they didn't expect to make. So now times are difficult. Put that money back into helping those families because they really desperately need it. It's not just a case of politics here. This is about people yeah. feeling like they can live and they can look after their kids. Mm -hmm. And many older people as well. I was a home help. I saw people in big, huge houses who'd live in the kitchen with a little stove on for an hour in the cold. I don't want any older person in our country thinking they have to do that. And they will do that. Yeah. Even if they've got big, huge houses, you'll see them in the kitchen with a little stove on for an hour because they'll be worried about spending Spend so money. much money on, on, their, on their energy bills. We've got to do something to help. Well, yeah, we have to leave it thank there. You, thank uh, you. But thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Thank you.